What's going on, baseball fans? Welcome to episode three of This Week in Baseball featuring Diamond Digest. Once again, I am your host, Jordan Lazowski. Welcome back, everyone. And today on the broadcast, we have Callie Sai, per usual, joined by Thatcher Zalewski and Peter Kayet. Thatcher, Peter, how are we doing today? Pretty good. Pretty good. How about you? Happy to be here. Yeah. <laughs> Happy to have you both here, Kelly. As usual, welcome back uh-huh. as a mainstay on this week in baseball. We got a lot to talk about today. We got a lot going on with COVID per usual, some less interesting stuff at some points, but also some more inter- interesting stuff with other teams. The Red Sox, A's, Astros all making uh, names in the news recently, and we'll bring it around with our storylines and what we're going to tell you to watch for this week. But let's start like we do every week. If the season ended today, because it could at any point due to COVID and the world we are experiencing, here is what the standings would look like. In the AL West, the A's and the Rangers would make the playoffs. The Central would feature the Twins and the Indians. The East, the Yankees, and the still surprising Orioles. (laughs) And the wild card would be the Rays, and then a tie between the Astros and the Tigers, and I do not know the tiebreaker rules, but I'm sure one of them would have it over the other, since they are not playing in the same um, division. But you, you're around 500, you're into the playoffs in this format. Mm-hmm. In the NL, from the West, the Dodgers and the Rockies hold the top two spots. The Cubs and the Cardinals hold the top two, despite the Cardinals only playing seven games because of covid It is done by winning percentage, and they are in second place. The East features the Marlins and the Braves, the once again Marlins, staying in the playoff picture. And the wild card wraps up with the Brewers and Cali's hat-featured Padres remain in the playoffs for another week. My outdated hat. (laughs) So there, there are some teams that, you know, we're expecting to see there some of the early season I guess, variety, and there's a word I'm forgetting as a math major that I should remember, but I don't remember it. Variance, there it is. The variance is starting to even itself out a little bit. You see the Tigers going from the top spot in the AL Central to a team that's on the fringes of a wild card. So you're starting to see it start to normal out, normalize out. Um, the Orioles continue to surprise. The Marlins continue to surprise. I'll turn it over to you guys. Any other big surprises? coming out of the standings for any of them. Uh, The Rays not being one of the teams competing for the AL East title is very surprising. I I mean, I think we all predicted this to be the year that they really took a shot at the Yankees, and that has just not happened so far. Yeah, Yeah, I think um, the surprising Orioles has really thrown a wrench in that so far to start the season. I think the Rockies are another surprising team. They're not known to have the best pitching staff, and somehow they're holding their own there in the West with a 12-8 and record as of now. Um, I think maybe not even as much record-wise, but the Padres, um, they've had a lot of individual player surprises, especially with Tatis. I mean, oh, yeah. maybe some people weren't surprised about him, but I definitely did not think he would start the season this well. And um, also the fact that the Diamondbacks have not – competed with them for the uh for that or the diamondbacks second no they're not they're, they're the diamondbacks are out of the playoffs right correct yeah right now sure. yeah. yeah so I, I i thought the diamondbacks would be right there for second in that division and they're fourth so that's a surprise for me yeah the diamondbacks <laughs> being a team that spent a lot and you know they gave out that big contract to Bumgarner. they went and got calhoun to fill out right field it's been a team that necessarily hasn't met expectations so far and you're seeing in a competitive NL West this year with three of the four playoff team or three of the eight excuse me playoff teams coming from the NL West right now it's clearly a very competitive division at this point well Calhoun has been a so far pretty good signing for them Baumgartner not so much (laughs) yeah yeah Kelly's like yeah I'm not too worried about that I'm a Padres (laughs) fan (laughs) What do you think about Yonder Alonso coming back? We signed Machado to get Alonso. Yeah. (laughs) Which is the inverse of the White Sox. I mean, you know, 
at some point in that process it worked for somebody and i'm just gonna leave it at that as a white Sox fan and it happens it shouldn't have but i digress but we will continue to watch the standings over the next couple weeks as we wonder if the orioles can really hold on in the al really good their hitting has been awesome they they've been a team that legitimately has been able to hit its way into the playoffs and yeah over 60 games you know people talk about the variance and you know whether or not these things count i've been pretty vocal about it counts it's 60 games everyone is under the same conditions not necessarily expecting the orioles and the marlins to be the two teams up there as well as the tigers the tigers are still competing and those Mm -hmm. are three of the teams you assumed were sellers and we're rebuilding coming into this year and now three of the 16 teams are considered rebuilding teams. So that's going to be interesting for the number one pick too, because those mm-hmm. are three teams we would uh, expect to contend for that number one spot. And you could argue that at least maybe the Orioles and the Tigers might be already out of that sweepstakes. It also depends on how they're mm-hmm. going to do pick who gets the number one pick, if it'll be a lottery or just a yeah. horse record. Mm-hmm. You bring up a good point because that's something a lot of people have talked about. It's can you mm-hmm. necessarily keep it the same way that it's been in past years and I think I mentally thought they probably could have kept it the same, but now you're looking at some of the teams rising to the top, the Red Sox sitting there at something like 714, Angels sitting there at 714. Those aren't bad enough teams to deserve a top five pick, yeah. really. Yeah. yeah. I would feel very odd about maybe the Red Sox not so – well, the Red Sox pitching seems to be a one-year type COVID thing, but, I mean, you have Chris Sale and Eduardo Rodriguez coming back. Well, Chris Sale might be a little bit longer, but, I mean, that's not a team with that offense. Same with the Angels that I feel particularly comfortable saying, yeah, let's just keep it the same, and those teams towards the top are going to get those first run, or so those first, uh, first five or so draft picks. So that's actually a really good point, Peter. But we will continue to watch that, continue to monitor the standings, and, you know, maybe as we get more information about what they're going to decide to do with the draft, we will bring that to you. Pottery, pottery, pottery. I, I honestly don't know what they're going to do. I, I would be surprised if they kept it the same, but also I think they could do something like a lottery and maybe um, have some more intrigue into what happens. I saw something that said they might um, – something this morning, I think it might have been a Peter Gammon's tweet, where said they might um, like factor in 2019 and 2020 standings. It's an interesting because thought. Because he gets the number one pick. It's so an I don't know thought. how they would do that, like if they would wait 2020 more than 2019. Yeah. He obviously yeah. play more games in 2019. That would be interesting to see. You always have to factor in, too, that teams did get better. Like, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's exactly. N- that too. It, it's not fair to say from 2019, 2019. Look at the Padres in the top 10 pick. Right. It, it's like yeah. the Padres are a team are in the playoffs. They've clearly gotten better. But are you comfortable waiting them the same because Padres had a top 10 pick last year. Mm -hmm. It'll be interesting. I'm curious to see what they do. But all of this being due to COVID and the wonderful scenario that COVID has given to us, we spent the past couple weeks talking about the Marlins and the Cardinals. Marlins have returned to action. Cardinals returned and took two from the White Sox in a doubleheader yesterday. Expanding the thought process that maybe entire teams are trying to use COVID as the next... um, uh, market inefficiency at this point but the team of the topic this week peter's indians had a little bit of a rough stretch Sox and or excuse me the white Sox and the indians played a series in chicago recently and after the series zach plesak and mike clevender decided to go out on the town in chicago enjoy what little is open out here (laughs) And as a result, after team meetings, and I will let Peter go into this more because he's probably followed it closer than most of us have, being an Indians fan, the team decided to send them away for a couple days and has now optioned both pitchers to their uh, taxi facility, their uh, alternate site facility, and are now without 40% of their starting rotation. But Peter, I'll let you start and talk about right. 
in the situation as you see it from the perspective of an Indians fan? Yeah, so I, um, as somebody who has uh, in many of my articles criticized uh, the decisions of this organization, this they have actually handled this. I don't think they could have handled it better. Um, whether or not it's for PR or whether or not they actually think this is the right thing to do, uh, the way they dealt with it by, you know, first punishing Klesak, making him drive home by himself, I thought that was uh, kind of funny. And um, now optioning them both to AAA, like they're not messing around with it, especially with Carlos Carrasco, a Panther survivor on the team, probably more medically vulnerable to COVID than most other players. Um, yeah, and I, uh, I did see there was the interesting point that if they keep Clevenger in AAA for 20 days or something, they get an extra year of control um, on the end of his rookie deal. So that, that could also be another motivating factor because the Cleveland Indians, as we know, do not like to pay their players. But, um, I mean, before, like, I, I hate to give this organization the benefit of the doubt, but I think at this point that's what we have to do. And I think thus far – I couldn't have asked for them to handle it better. And even though it's going to hurt our rotation, I definitely think it's the right thing to do. Her. I think, yeah, I, th- I think the players didn't necessarily help themselves either. Plisek came out with a video. Yeah, 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 for sure. And then Plisek got rightly criticized by the media for it, both before and after the video incident. And, you know, it's not necessarily the best handling of the situation by either player's perspective, especially, like you said, Peter, when you consider one of their teammates, one of their yeah. rotation mates is a cancer survivor. And, you know, he's putting his life on the line when he goes out there to pitch every five days. So I, I think it'll be an interesting thing to watch from two perspectives, how the Indians decide to handle it uh, moving forward, but also how the Indians – handle playing without 40 percent of their normal rotation i mean you can't imagine it hurting them that bad because they still have Bieber, they still have carrasco they still have Plunko, they still have aaron Sebale, they still have incredibly talented pitchers on the roster that can fill their fill the void of clevinger and Kwesak. Mm-hmm. and i think that might have made it an easier decision for the management to make sending them all down to AAA as well as what Peter said with Clevenger's contract. Yeah, Cleveland's a pitching factory from an outside perspective. It's a team that There's a you, Vanderbilt of the MLB. Yeah, you're getting team you're getting players like Aaron Savale and Zach Plesak and you're like, oh, okay, we could get to face those two guys in the in a three-game series, I'm feeling good about taking two or three, and then all of a sudden you turn around, you're down 0-2 in a series, and you just face those mm-hmm. two guys. Cleveland's a pitching factory, absolutely. And I think that, you know, if you want to take it from the perspective of does it hurt the team, probably not. The AL Central is pretty weak. The NL Central outside of the Cubs is pretty weak. They'll be able to mm-hmm. keep their playoff spot. They'll probably be able to hold their own, just from my perspective. Um, but, you know, you look at it from the perspective of how – whenever they come back to the team, because you'd assume they at some point come back to the team, whether it's this year, next year, whatever, what are the optics looking like? I mean, Adam Plutko was very vocal against what both players did, and I'm sure within the clubhouse there were many people vocal against what they did, and it'll create an interesting dynamic for Terry Francona to have to try and navigate as the manager out there. Yeah, I uh, I think – I definitely admire um, – because especially with a clubhouse dynamic like that, like you said, it's not always for, easy for players to come out and say stuff like Plutko did that, um, that you know, might not sit well with your teammates. But I think, um, I think the reaction of the other players has definitely shown how big of a deal, not even the organization, but the players take this to be, which is the correct thing to do. And, yes, yeah, as far as, like, the pitching goes, um, I mean, over, like, a season and a half at this point, I mean, we're only 20 games into this season, but we've lost Bauer, Kluber, now Plesak and Clevenger if they don't come back anytime soon. So it definitely is concerning. I think um, if we call up some pitchers to try to help with long relief, or maybe I, I, I find it hard to believe that we could add another solid rotation guy, but it'll be interesting to see who, what they do personnel-wise to try to fill that gap. Yeah, watching the Indians, they're a team that – it's likely not to go 
away anywhere, unfortunately, as a White Sox fan. However, you know, you appreciate how they're dealing with it. You appreciate the fact that they're taking it seriously enough as both a team and an organization and as players um, to reprimand them the way that they did. And I, I don't necessarily think it was an easy decision by any means for the Indians to make, but I think it was the right one. Uh, something you had mentioned already, Peter. And again, it'll be interesting to see how that develops over the coming weeks, because I'm, I'm sure they're not the only two players across baseball who have done something along these lines. And now that the line in the stand has kind of been drawn about, you know, where the line stands and if you cross it, what's going on and what's the ramifications. I wonder how that extends to other teams and how they decide to handle anyone who is unable to follow whatever team protocols they have in place and whatever league protocols they are, they have in place too. But another interesting COVID development, I'm curious to see what we'll be talking about next week because it has never failed to give us something to talk about. <coughs> Excuse me, from week to week. But on top of COVID injuries and COVID DL, or excuse me, IL uh, stints, we have had as a result of COVID in this season, many, many injuries to talk about throughout these weeks. We've got some new ones for you, some very high profile names, and we continue to have pitchers dropping like flies, honestly. It's, it's pretty concerning to see the start to the season and how Maybe the ramp up on time in COVID affected many of these players. We'll start with the two on the pitching side. Uh, Steven Strasburg was pulled from his start. They're calling it a right hand injury. I think that's incredibly vague enough to say I'm not sure what's going on with that one. Kirby I Yates. I saw something. Oh, go ahead. Carpal tunnel. I saw something for Strasburg saying like carpal tunnel in his hand, right hand. Hmm. So I don't know. If that's what they're going with, but. It's something where, like you're saying, either way, it's an incredibly vague way to kind of talk about the injury. And yeah. in a way, it's kind of concerning. Going along with the mm -hmm. vague arm injuries, we'll go with Kirby Yates out in San Diego with elbow inflammation. It's never a great sign to hear anything going on with the elbow. And Feeling really bad for him, too, because he – this was a contract here for him. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a really good point, too. It's someone who – he wants to worry about getting his next contract, worry about getting in the league next year. You're not doing yourself any favors not being able to play on the field. And that's mm -hmm. concerning My from his perspective. 2019 as an aberration. Yeah. I mean, that's the problem for a lot of teams this year too, especially those who decide to opt out as well. You bring up a good point. Anyone who might've had a good year in 2019 and is not playing this year is too hurt to play this year. No teams view 2019 as – an aberration versus the new real deal of Normal. what the player is. Yeah. I, I think that's a very valid concern. Some other players who might not have those um, worries about their contract or what teams across the league think about them, like Kirby Yates might. Two Braves go on the DL, or excuse me, the IL with a sore wrist injury, Ronald Acuna and Ozzy Albies. Albies is closer to um, – getting back into game action, whereas Acuna was just recently put on the IL. Um, it was, a believe, I believe, a yesterday decision. They originally had said they were not going to put him on the IL. The Braves just cannot catch a break injury-wise. Yeah. No. But, I mean – With Puig, too, to begin the yeah. season. Yeah. That outfield yeah. has uh, not had an easy go so far. Mm -hmm. It makes Marquecas coming back seem all the bigger for them, honestly, and deciding to play – despite originally opting out. He is someone that, you know, you didn't expect to play a huge role, but now with this team still in second place in the AL, or excuse me, the NL East, it's, it's all hands on deck. You got to find a way to test that depth. And this, this is a year where a lot of teams are testing their depth. Mm -hmm. Andrew Benintendi, who had a pretty poor start to his season, Went on the 10-day IL with a rib injury. You wonder how much that played into how he was playing or, I mean, rather something that just flared up recently. I mean, that's a, that's a talented ball player who was just not playing well. Yeah. And DJ LeMayhew, the Yankee injuries continue. First Aaron Judge, yeah. then it was Stan, who is now off the IL. 
But DJ LeMahieu now goes back on. Yankees can't catch a break. LeMahieu goes on with a thumb injury. I mean, it's not like the Yankees are going to miss him that much. They have a team WRC plus of like 126. Yeah, when you talk about testing your depth and testing the strength of your team as a whole, there are many teams who are able to do it, and there are many teams who are not. There are many teams like the White Sox who lose their yeah. starting second baseman and now have Chesler Cuthbert and Ryan Goins <laughs> on their roster. Yeah. And are one injury away from seeing a lot of those guys play. I mean, it's a concerning issue for teams, and I think it's something that brings to light for a lot of teams, you know, going into the 2021 season, what's my depth actually look like? And and what does this team actually look like if significant injuries go down? I, I don't think that for as much planning as you can do for a rotation or for a lineup that you know, you're never, you're never going to be able to get to where the Yankees and Dodgers are, per se. But yeah. you, you got to find a way to, you know, really reevaluate yourselves going into next season. I think a lot of teams are going to have to take that step back and do that. Maybe not the Braves. They're, they're assuming those guys are going to come back and it'll be fine. Mm-hmm. But maybe those teams that are a little bit coming off the end of their rebuild or are at the end of um, their – championship window of sorts and those are the teams that really got to start to worry about it again forgot one name uh birch smith uh and you just got to feel incredibly bad for the guy. he was putting together an, an incredible year he had it given up and given up and earned run all year when he entered the game yesterday yesterday as of this recording against the giants and then his fastball dropped to 91 miles per hour. He gave up a three-run home run to Darian Ruff, and then he's placed on the IL with forearm strain, which could be a very bad sign of further elbow damage. Now, I mean, you're he was the A's best reliever by X rule, but you, you just feel terrible for him because he struggled his entire major league career, but now he had – a stellar season being put together, and now it's gone. Or at least yeah. there's a roadblock. Yeah, you're starting to see a lot more of those those forearm strains, those yeah. injuries. Again, it's, it's something we've talked about a lot, but when you only have two and a half weeks to get ready and then you're going full force, I, not enough arms are used to this, and it's mm-hmm. concerning as you talk more and more about the integrity of the season and what, what does it mean to win the world series in this 60 game season? Now when aces start dropping like flies and star players start dropping, it, 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 it worries you as a fan of, you know, what's the long term outlook for some of these guys. I mean, sore wrist is one thing, but elbow inflammation, right hand, forearm strain. This is, these are long-term big deals that go beyond whatever happens this 2020 season. So, mm-hmm. Absolutely something worth watching as this continues, and hopefully the list of injuries we discuss week to week gets shorter and shorter, but yeah. again, it's it's not something that, at least from my perspective, I don't know any of how any of you feel. I, I don't feel it's something that's going to change all that much. I, I don't yeah. think at this point... Yeah, unfortunately. I, I, I don't foresee, you know, now that they're stretched out, it's all going to feel better i I don't think there's a point at which we can come back from that injuries are going to keep coming week after week Mm -hmm. socks are lucky tim anderson just came off the il before leary got injured because then we would be seeing ryan goins or chelsea cuthbert in that second base and shortstop yeah when you talk about nightmare scenarios um yeah certainly not one as a Sox fan i want to deal with oh yeah but Let's they get to cloned a bunch of top clones Tommy John and given a copy of one to each team. Yeah, there you go. There there's an idea. That 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 is certainly an idea I have not heard before. I, I will say that one. But let's get in a couple of the big news stories from the week week before um we talk about our personal storylines. We'll start with the Astros. You know, that's a lineup that continues to struggle. They're sitting 10 and 10. Jose Altuve hitting a buck 81. George Springer a buck 85. I know we don't necessarily let batting average be the end all be all, but at the end of the day, those numbers are still concerning. Kyle Tucker 
former top prospect has not really caught his uh, footing in the major leagues. He's got an extended look now with Jordan Alvarez being out, but only hitting a buck 92. It, it's concerning for them on the offensive side. Lance McCullers hasn't looked great in his return. He's looked rather pedestrian, not I'm sure what they were expecting for a team that already has a rotation weakness. But Jordan Alvarez did return to Houston this week, hopefully bringing some stability to that lineup as a team with a lot of um, talent and potential to work in the AOS. Kelly, I know you're also an A's fan, so you're like, no, I don't want them to make their return. I don't want Jose Altuve to start hitting, but... The after big weakness is not their offense. They have a team with WRC Plus of one oh eight. Some players are underperforming, but a lot of other ones are rising to the occasion. What's the issue is they're, they're putting guys like Cy Snead in their bullpen. That's the issue. Their bullpen is made up of a bunch of minor league players, same as their rotation. Aside from Granky, McCullers, and Josh James, there aren't really any established major league guys. And Josh James is also, if he has an, as an established major league guy, that's their issue. And I think it would be will be very interesting to see if they start buying at the deadline for pitchers. Yeah, the Verlander injury really killed them and opened up that mm-hmm. division yeah. for sure. The Astros are an interesting team because you, you talk about years of being the the gold standard of what it means to rebuild and, you know, despite um, trash can gate and all that fun stuff and all the cheating that went on with that, you know, it, it's still a team that was built to, to win long-term and to have that depth. And, it, and it's weird to talk about a team now and it's the downside of that rebuilding stage of, you're, you're getting towards the end of that contention window of sorts, and you're starting to see the holes start to open up again. And, you know, depth is a huge part of the Astros currently, and, or the Astros' problem currently. And, and, and it's an interesting dynamic now that they have to go and try and solve. And, Cal, you bring up a good point. Is it going to be a team that buys at the deadline? You, you would assume that very few teams are not buying at the deadline, which yeah. it m- makes it very – Weird scenario for teams because if everyone's buying, who's selling at this point? And I'm not necessarily convinced that, you know, teams like the Orioles are going to sit there and say, yeah, I want to sell right now. I, I, I don't know how teams are going to decide to handle this with the expanded playoffs. But I really think the only team you can see selling are the Red Sox and the Mariners. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. I'm- Pittsburgh, if whatever they have. Yeah. Pittsburgh's also Pittsburgh, though. So. Yeah. yeah. Pittsburgh's in a rough spot. They lost their only really valuable trade piece due to reasons I won't talk about. Ah, uh, yes. But at the same time, you look at teams that – you look at teams like the Red Sox and say, how much do they want to sell off at this point versus how much do they want to keep around? I mean – I, I don't necessarily see them selling guys like Bogart or Devers necessarily, but but Ben Attendee, maybe Mar- ben, J. Martinez. Martinez probably. The problem with Ben Attendee though too is you're gonna have to sell low now. He's had a couple yeah. he, he last year was last year wasn't great and this year he hasn't looked great. Now he's got the injury. It it'll be interesting mm-hmm. to see how they handle that. Gonna have to play up his college career. Right. And it's like <laughs> when when Blue pig. When they want to sell, and the reason you have to sell is because the talent that's there isn't performing, it becomes an interesting scenario for teams to try and deal with. Mm-hmm. And I also think the, the point you brought up about how so many teams might be buying, it'll be interesting to see in 2021, 2022, when we start playing full seasons again, at least hopefully. Um, yeah. maybe there's a team like the Orioles or a team that, you know, is fighting for a seven, eight spot right now that buys this season. And then down the road, they're stuck with a bunch of pieces that are built to win 75, 80 games. And all of a sudden mm-hmm. that's not good enough anymore. Now they're stuck in limbo because they bought in a shortened season where they might not even have a chance anyway. So it'll be interesting they- to see if teams make any short-sighted decisions because of this crazy season. 
there might be another Chris Archer trade. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, somewhere you make it such a short sighted move that I mean it, it's hard to sit here and say I, I wanna believe more in the executive executives of teams, I guess. Just really just take a good look at your roster and be like, Hey, I, I know this really isn't sustainable. Where it's so like maybe even if you like think about a team an organization that's been really run really well, like the Astros, like maybe they say this might be a good chance to sell. And then all of a sudden, 2022, they come back with a bunch of hot shot prospects and they're ready to contend again. So it'll like, there's the side of maybe two teams buy and get themselves in a pickle a couple of years down the road. But also, there are some teams that could definitely take advantage of this and get some really good prospects for teams trying to buy. It's a good point. You can take and advantage of those teams. Mariners, I can see doing that. Yeah, you really take advantage of those teams that decided, hey, even if it is this one year, it's going to keep the fan base interested. It's going to keep people interested. I'm buying in, mm-hmm. and I'm buying at the deadline when maybe necessarily I shouldn't. And th- That'll be interesting to monitor because you, you yeah. have teams hanging around. We're in week three, and we're still talking about three rebuilding teams potentially making the playoffs. Uh-huh. The Orioles still have Mancini waiting to come – eventually going to come back. That's true. That's a good point. Yeah. I mean, for a team that's hitting – Mm-hmm. Adding that to a lineup down the line, that that's an interesting one too. Yeah, it, it's curious to see how people handle it. Now, I mean, with the deadline fast approaching, it'll be plenty for us to talk about in the coming weeks. I hope it's a fun and active deadline, but I could also see it being where everyone wants to buy, no one wants to sell. There's a couple minor moves at the deadline, and nothing really happens. Or the lack of knowledge about players in the alternate sites mm-hmm. leads to people being sheepish on whether or not it's worth to trade for them. Oh, yeah. That's a good point, too. Yeah. You can think about that. I might be making this up, so apologies if I am. I thought I read somewhere that there was the potential for teams to start doing some data sharing amongst the alternate uh, yeah, camp I, teams. I read Yo, that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I saw that. Which lends to your point, Callie, of – you know, how do I really want to trade for someone on this alternate side if I haven't seen them? Mm-hmm. Um, so, so that'll be an interesting thing to see if that uh, data sharing moves things anywhere. Um, yeah. I'm not sure if it's been confirmed or it's more so just been talked about, but... Like I mean, maybe there was a player who had an interesting season at high A or double A, mm-hmm. but she don't really want to trade for them since they haven't proved, since they haven't proved themselves at, say, triple A. That right. could be a situation where you really don't trade for them but now with the data sharing hopefully that does allow for increased trades increased bullishness in the market yeah i mean you're you're strictly going off whatever the pitch metrics say whatever the swing metrics say that that's still such a risky move i i don't see i mean a lot of risk averse teams deciding to say i trust the metrics enough without seeing them perform also, didn't it come out that the Astros had doctored some of their prospects pitching uh, metrics to uh, sell them high? Yeah, that, this that could be open for more manipulation. Yeah, that's a good point. There, there is. I, I think that's a valid concern, even, even though it's kind of an out there type statement at first thought, because if all you have to go off of is the thing that can be pretty easily manipulated, you can change spreadsheets, you can change data um, yeah. i'm hoping that i mean initially i thought in. it was a typo when uh when i read that um Bert smith had one of the best fastball spins in baseball right. this year but changes like that do happen right so that, that's honestly something you know you bring it up and it's worth monitoring too but not something you can necessarily yeah, i mean i wouldn't put it past a lot of teams honestly yeah. if 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 it's as easy as changing a couple numbers on a spreadsheet and you know what teams are looking for, like, mm-hmm. yeah, I, the foundation it, well, of trust in this whole operation is uh, right. quite fragile. Right. And I mean, you know, you talk about teams like the Astros, like they were the ones who got caught for cheating. Let, let, let's not pretend they're the only team yeah. in major league baseball that was trying to do something similar or did do something similar. And the same goes here. It, it's not, it feels very, put a tinfoil hat on and have this conversation. But at the same time, we're getting so it's much information. It's wholeheartedly to act like only one organization yeah. pushes the envelope the way the Astros did. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. Which is why it's an interesting conversation. Certainly something, um, you, you wonder how something like that could play into the trade deadline. It, it'll be interesting to see what happens with um, the trades. So I'm very, very interested in seeing what this deadline looks like. Yeah. We only got, what, 15 or so days. Yeah, August 16th. So we'll be talking about this soon. Okay. Yeah. Some other storylines around the league. Speaking of teams struggling, we've talked about the Red Sox a lot. You know, Thursday night was a rough night for the Red Sox. They started rookie Kyle Hart and actually had a lead 3-2 to two after the first inning. I, I don't think a lot of people who think about Thursday night's game remember this. By the end, Jose Peraza and Kevin Ploiecki, both position players, pitched. Christian Vasquez, the Red Sox catcher, played second base. And Sue Lin, a shortstop in their organization, caught. And, oh yeah, the Red Sox <laughs> lost 17-8. to eight. Um, It just highlights the Red Sox struggles this season and how, how important, you know, you talk about pitching wins championships and pitching and defense wins championships, whatever you want to say. And then you look at the Red Sox as a team like, I'm not sure how anyone thought this was going to be a team that made the playoffs this year. It, yeah. it's, it's a rough look for them. It's a team that, you know, their season has stalled rather quickly and has started to be the topic of conversation of, ooh, who are we going to draft this year? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, the, who are we going to trade this year? The Red Sox have basically become the mess of the American League, except no. somehow yeah. even worse because they don't have the bullpen or the Grom. No. And a worse offense, actually, too. Yeah. So it's really sad to see how far they've fallen, mostly due to how penny pinching John Henry has been. And at the same time, they've also with, been hit by injuries, yes. As, but at the same time, too, I mean, it's the Dave Dombrowski effect. It was, it's how he ran the Tigers, it's how he ran the Red Sox before he left town. It's spend, get him at the major league level, forget about the prospects because at the end of the day, flags fly forever. I mean, yeah, they got a ring out of it. So you can't necessarily knock the strategy, but at the same time, when you're talking about sustained success, it, it, it looks different for every team, I'll be honest. And I mean, as a White Sox fan, you talk about wanting a run of good teams. Would, would you trade it all for one championship again? I, I think you'd be hard pressed to say, no, I wouldn't trade. Yeah. Yeah. the necessary prospects and gut my farm system if it meant I was going to get a World Series. Like, I mean, that 2018 Red Sox team was one of the best teams of all time. Yeah. I mean, you, you look at that and you're like, would I trade the entire farm system again to do that? Probably. I mean, that team had three Hall of Famers on it. Kimbrell, Sale, Bess. Yeah. And now you're looking at a team that Sale's hurt, Kimbrell's gone, Betts is gone. Mm-hmm. And you have no prospects to really show for it outside of a few. But at the Devers, same time, Bogarts, they're not really prospects, but they're young players. Yeah. You got a few, you, you got yeah. some pieces, but you've got no reinforcements. So you're talking about the depth okay. problem again. You've got nothing to reinforce it with. Brock Holt's gone. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. Brock Holt. I forgot about him. And if they wanted to acquire some pitching, I mean, there's not, like you said, there's not a lot of um, pro- enticing prospects for other teams. Right. So they're it, kind of like we talked about, kind of stuck in limbo where they have a really good offense, but they don't have the pieces to acquire better pitching. And if they just did a full fire sale, I mean, maybe they could take someone's full, whole farm system for the pieces they have, but it's uh, unclear whether or not they're willing to do that. Yeah. It'll be interesting how Bloom decides to handle it. New face, new guy running the organization. And... But Kim flags fly really forever. Guy. Yeah. Very interesting guy, very interesting pieces going on in Boston. But mm-hmm. like I said, at the end of the day, you got the ring. You got – there's only one champion each year. Yeah. I mean, I don't think I even know a Red Sox prospect besides from Pete Crow Armstrong. What's his name? I keep, I keep yeah. drafting this guy in my fantasy baseball. Uh, Dal Beck. He's one I – Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The first baseman they have, too. Which is, yeah. Casas? Maybe. Yeah, I think so. And we can't forget about Rusny Castillo. Oh, yes, of yeah. course. The all-time. Yeah. Yeah. 
the all-time version of trying to pay your way to a championship, Rosny Castillo. But that is the end of our uh, – Let's can you name the Red Sox prospects? We'll move on to a team that's maybe a little bit more exciting, Cali's Oakland Athletics, a team that when you talk about a team that just will not die in games recently, two late-inning comebacks against the Giants back recently. Back-to-back. Back-to-back games. Kelly, they're rolling. Yeah. I mean, nobody should really be surprised. I mean, the A's do hold the record for most walk-off wins in a season with the 2012 season. Bob Melvin was at the helm of that team. He's at the helm of this team. This team will not die no matter what. And I think we do have to give some thanks to uh, Gabe Kapler for sending in Trevor Gott back-to-back yeah. back days. You don't have to talk about teams that are tanking. Yeah, there's a good, there's a good one there. Yeah, you know, it, it's an interesting point you bring up about the walk off wins and stuff. And I mean, I'm curious from a fan perspective, having never sat in a major league dugout, having never played baseball beyond high school, the the, the tone that a manager sets for games, and how much I know. We talk a lot about you know managers really aren't not that useful, but at the same time, they're they're not going to win or lose you too many games. They're, yeah, the they're, manager of the year award should, I think, shouldn't exist. It should just be the general manager of the year award. But they're still important. They still help clubhouse cohesion. Right. They can, they can still help the players. Right. By yeah. Maybe seeing things that a younger mm-hmm. player might not. Maybe you know, making a decision some other players might not be totally confident in. Pinch running uh, Franklin Barreto for Matt Olson is very interesting. Olson's an odd great runner. He's like the 30th percentile for sprint speed, but he's a great defender. So you might want that in the uh, ninth inning if you do get the lead. So that was a very interesting decision. Ended up not mattering because because uh, of the home run, but it's an interesting decision that he made. One thing I did notice that I want to talk about it's less about the walk off and more about how pitchers are pitching. So, when Mark Canna came to the plate, Scott put him in a full count, three four. What would you throw in this situation? Scott decided to throw a fastball and ended up being the wrong decision. But there are two outs in that game. Why? It's, it is a risky move to walk the bases loaded, but you get one out, you win the game. So why not try and throw an off-speed pitch to try and get Anna to bite on it? And I think that fastballs do have the worst uh, x but in the major league. So uh, compared to off-speed pitches, at least. So I think that we might see in the future – Pitchers pitch differently in situations like that, at least hopefully. Less challenging fastball. Yes, that's true. But God, he <laughs> wants the contract, obviously. He, is, he doesn't care about whether or not the Giants draft him are. Yeah. In the future, I hope we see, if there's two outs, less challenging hitters and more trying to get them to hit weak contact. Because there's really no reason you would challenge such a great hitter with the game on the line when you have a base open you have a multi-run lead you if you walk in a run you still have the lead why not try and nibble around the zone throw some Mm -hmm. off speed stuff i just think it's a very questionable decision it's a good point yeah no it's a good point you bring up and i mean you know you look at it from a decision making perspective but at the end of the day you got to give it to the athletics Mm -hmm. as a team that great Great just, yeah. uh, at bat by Canada, just yeah. sitting on the off speed stuff uh, he was offering, Scott was offering. I mean, having a good at bat. I mean, just a good, a group of grouping of good at bats, like in two straight games. Mm-hmm. Um, something that, you know, you wonder if teams are checking out early and when they're down early. And, you know, it brings it back to the manager setting the tone making sure these guys don't check out after a three-run first inning or a bad first inning or, you know, they give the lead the seventh, don't check out after that. 
the most notable scene to me was that with Steven Piscotti and Mark Hanna hitting those home runs, not Matt Olson or Marcus Simeon or Matt Chapman who did. This mm-hmm. lineup has a ton of depth, except for maybe Chris Davis and catchers. Everyone in this lineup can hit. Everybody in this lineup can get on base. I yeah. think it's a very underrated lineup. Yeah. I mean, they're in first place in the AL West for a reason. And I think yeah. you mentioned the uh, bat quality, the depth, the manager. I think it's a more complete ball club than I probably would have given it credit for, if I'm being honest. Um, I think they're showing why. I think, you know, even if for their weaknesses, they're finding ways to make up for it. Mm-hmm. I think that's that's the sign of a good ball club. That's a sign of a team that is going to be able to do some damage in the playoffs. So Kelly with two playoff teams currently is a very happy baseball fan as we speak. However, mm-hmm. let's get to the storylines across the league. You know, we've talked about some of the big news, but we have different perspectives from a White Sox fan, an Indians fan, and then an A's and a Padres fan. We're all seeing different things across the league, and that's why we do our weekly storylines. Thatcher, we'll start with you. Well, What's your storyline for the that. week? Well, my story for the week is successful pitching around the league, specifically like the more underrated names. And going back to that Boston game that we were talking about, where uh, they had Pilecki and Peraza pitch, I think we got to give credit to Joss Oshich, a uh, former White Sox reliever from last year. He pitched two innings in that game, only gave up one hit, and then struck out five batters. I, I mean, against the Rays, who are a competitive t- team with a – pretty underrated good lineup pretty impressive and I thought he was pretty good last year I mean the Sox and his appearances but I mean and then we got Randy Dobnak from the Twins 0.9 ERA and 20 innings pitched 11 strikeouts only five walks and his whip is actually the same as his ERA then Dylan Bundy uh a lot of people thought when the yeah. Angels were going out to get pitching, Dylan Bundy was not a name they should have gotten, but he's actually been pretty surprising for her. I the, laughed at the Angels when they signed him, and look who's laughing now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 1.57 ERA and 28.2 innings pitch, 35 strikeouts, only three walks, and a 0.63 whip. And then you have Dilson Lamette from the Padres. 1.61 ERA, 22 innings pitched, 28 strikeouts, 7 walks, 0.85 whip. Spencer Turnbull, a 2 ERA, 18 innings pitched, 18 strikeouts, 7 walks, and a 1 whip. Uh, Muriel Kelly from the Diamondbacks, uh, 2.29 ERA, 19 innings pitched, 15 strikeouts, 1 walk, and a 0.97 whip. Chris Bassett, another one of Kelly's teams. 2.42 ERA, 22 innings pitch, 19 strikeouts, 4 walks, and a 0.90 whip. Jordan Romano from the Blue Jays, a 0 ERA and 9 innings pitch, 13 strikeouts, 3 walks, and a 0.44 whip. Gregory Soto, another Detroit arm, who's been very impressive from yeah. watching him play against the Sox. A 0 ERA, 10 innings pitch, 14 strikeouts, 2 walks. 0.40 whip. Then one of my favorites so far is from the Sox this year, Matt Foster, who's been our kind of opener in our doubleheader games. He's got a zero ERA and 7.2 innings pitch. This was as of three days ago. So from the MOB's post, which I wanted to bring up in this, uh, he has 0.2 innings pitch, 13 strikeouts, two walks, and a 0.52 whip. And then the last name from the Indians, a Going back with their pitching, James Kernchuk, Kernchuk, 1.04 ERA, 8.2 innings pitch, 17 strikeouts, five walks, and a 1.04 whip. So those are fantasy, some those teams. are some names you might want to pick up. Yeah, yeah, pick up for fantasy for sure. And then another name, well, who's been impressed, except I mean, kind of last night he struck or two nights ago, whenever he pitched last. Uh, Cody Hoyer for the Sox, another name that don't haven't heard before. Actually, coming out with a pretty impressive 
debut this year in his rookie campaign. I was impressed with him and his uh with his acts uh his games he pitched in the inner squad and uh practice games before the season actually started. I think the most interesting thing about a lot of those names you bring up, uh, Thatcher, mm-hmm. is that you know, outside of the names like Shane Beavers that you're expecting to be there, those are a lot of names that you wouldn't exactly expect to have great years. Yeah, you- um, I, I think <laughs> it's Chris Bassett. Well, you know, you wouldn't expect yeah. Chris Bassett to be amongst the top of the league. Maybe if you're not an A's fan, Kelly. Mm-hmm. But the point, the point being, you know, we, there's so many good pitching performances to point out from across the league, and they're not necessarily yeah. always the top names, the ones you'd expect. I would say Spencer Turnbull is somebody that has really come on the scene mm-hmm. for a struggling Detroit rotation has really helped them out along the way. But it, it's interesting to hear all those different names and all those rotation at this point might be generous. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, <laughs> if you follow one of our writers, Scott Bentley on Twitter, I think you should. He's a wonderful comedy fellow. Free Casey Mize. Yes. Yeah. So it's backwards. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, it's they actually bring up, like I said, you bring up a lot of good names and hopefully that we continue to see some really good pitching performances outside of those ones that, you know, we would normally expect to see Shane Bieber being a stud and Uh names like that. You mentioned a name I know Callie loves. So Callie, you can go next with your storyline. Tell us about uh, Lament. Danielson Lament is probably the most surprising pitcher this year. Not in terms of success. He was a pretty good pitcher, Last year, he had like a 1.9 F floor in less than 100 innings. He was talented. What is surprising is how he's finding even more success with uh, incredibly simple arsenal of pitches. It's fastball, slider, sinker. That's all he throws. And really, it should just be fastball and slider. But it's bringing him success that he, he hasn't seen before. He has a 2.77 FIP, he's sixth in K percentage among pitchers with 20 innings. He has a 2.8, he has a 0.285 X Woba, and his slider has an incredible 47.6 whiff rate. Now, if you go to a savant page, he will be in the lower regions when it comes to percentiles in uh, exit velocity. But that's only because his sinker gets absolutely hit. It has a 92.6x average exit velocity. His fastball and slider, on the other hand, they combined, they average just a 86.5 mile per hour average exit velocity. He's an incredibly talented pitcher that you couldn't make the case that he is the Padres' true ace now, not Chris Paddock, especially after Paddock's recent struggles. Padres have an interesting rotation. It, yeah. it, fe- it feels like a rotation when you look at it. It's like Garrett Richards is in it. Zach yeah. Davies. Zach Davies is in it. You And then Chris Paddock and then Lamette. It's like, why do I, as an outside fan maybe, I sit there and I'm like, why do I feel like that rotation probably shouldn't be as good as it is? I mean, Richards hasn't been able to stay healthy. You can argue he's finally been able to hit that potential because he's healthy. Zach Davies, same kind of story. I think that's a team you hear those names and good on the Padres for capitalizing on some of the potential we've seen from those guys over the years. Padres really stabilizing just, a rotation. The Padres have just one of the best talent identification teams in the MLB. Simply incredible. Cronenworth, Davies, Richards, these are all great players that they didn't really find, but they were able to get and take full advantage of. And coming into this season, Padres, they were expected to make the postseason, especially with the expanded rosters. But that was due to a lot of the discussion around them was Paddock, Davies, their bullpen. Well, that wasn't really talked about that much, but he's, sh- he's shown that he's incredibly worthy of a spotlight. Yeah. I think you're seeing a Padres team that has been going through a semi-rebuild in some sort of tear down through a while now and is starting to hit the fruits of that. Um, I mean, and capitalizing on some of those names, like you mentioned. We all know the jokes about hanging banners for having the best farm system. (laughs) But now that farm system is turning into the chance of raising actual banners. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's good. And 
I've never met a bigger Jake Cronenworth fan than you. I'll be honest. I you doubt get I will. You subreddit sometime. <laughs> but yeah, at least not on this. At least not on this page. There's no bigger fan than you. But the Padres, absolutely great storyline for this week. Peter, what do you got? Do we have a frozen Peter? All right. Oh, no. so, right now he's moving. Uh, All right. Um, not a huge storyline. Uh, I mean, it's been talked about a lot inside the AL Central. Are we good? You're still frozen. Nah, now you're uh, moving. Yeah. You hear me? Yes. yes. Mm-hmm. Good? Okay. Oh, the joys right. of Zoom. So, yeah. Not a huge uh, story, but last night um, – the Indians defeated the Tigers for the 19th straight time. Um, if any of you saw me and our colleague Scott Bentley were on the call for that game. Um, and that 19th straight becomes the second longest streak of one team beating another team um, since the live ball era. I believe the other one, don't remember the teams, but I believe it was from in this, uh, 1969 and 1970 season. So it's been a while. And actually, the third highest, they, were, they broke the tie with the also active streak of the Yankees beating the Orioles 18 straight times. So we'll see if they can resume that one this season. And I do think it's interesting to look at it because, like, when you look at a streak like that with the Yankees and the Orioles, like, the Yankees are, uh, have been a perennial 100-win team for the last couple of years. The Orioles have been the, arguably the worst team in the baseball the last couple of years. And while the Tigers have not been great, uh, have not been great by any stretch over this streak. The Indians have also not been great. I think they won 93 games in 2019, uh, 91 in 2018. So they've just been, you know. Good, but blood. not great. Right, well, like one of great, the worst but not... the last couple of years. Yeah, great, but not yeah, so... stellar. Right. Yeah. So this isn't the this isn't necessarily a team you expect to put together a streak like that against any given opponent, but it does really epitomize what the Indians have been since 2016. You know, they've been they've been a, a, a to some extent a perennial contender going to the World Series in 2016, winning 102 games in 2017, going back to the playoffs in 2018. But Breaking really the, the A's they win their streak. success. <laughs> 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 They derive their success from the weak division, really. They beat up mm-hmm. on the AL Central opponents. They're not great against good teams. So this really epitomizes what the Cleveland Indians are and how they are successful is by, you know, they win the games that they're supposed to win. And then, you know, when they play good teams, whatever happens, happens. So um, I do think it'll be interesting. I'll definitely be watching the next time the Yankees play the Orioles uh, to see if which one of these streaks ends up being longer. But, yeah, it has been interesting to watch, especially with uh, Spencer Turnbull on the Hill last night, who, like Thatcher said, has been having a great year. Yeah. You talking about how the uh, Tigers haven't been good in a while. It really reminds, going back to what Jordan said, how David Dombrowski runs his team. The A's, they ran up against the Tigers in the 2012-2013 playoffs. They made little baby Callie cry. (laughs) But – Look who's still competitive now. After a little retooling, the A's are still competitive, but the Tigers, they are they just had the number one pick in the major in the draft. So it's it really shows how fickle a mistress baseball can be unless you have one yeah. of those stellar, stellar GMs like Billy Bean. I mean, y- y- you speak to it, and it- it's the tale of two stories. Dombrowski runs two teams the exact same way. One gets a championship, one doesn't. It, 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 now, you're, if, if you're a Tigers fan, you probably feel worse about the state in which he left that farm system than you do as a Red Sox fan because you got a World Series out of it. I don't know. I'm just a White Sox fan. I can't really speak to that. But yeah, you, you bring up a good point, too, Peter, beating the teams you have to. If you beat the teams you have to, you're, you're going to end up – in the playoffs more often than not. Yeah, that's I mean, why I hate the saying, well, they've only played weak teams. Well, good teams beat, beat weak bad teams. teams. Yeah. If you're beating a bunch of bad teams, that's, that's still a testament to you're a good team. Right. I think if you can make a living off of beating the teams you need to beat, I think a lot of teams would take mm-hmm. that. <laughs> yeah. Wrapping up storylines, mine, you know, I didn't have strong opinions on the new extra inning rule when it came out. Oh, yeah. 
then the White Sox played the Indians <laughs> <laughs> last night on Sunday night base or last Sunday on Sunday night baseball. And all of a sudden I had really strong opinions on the extra inning rule. Go figure. Um, I think it's dumb that the runner starts at second base. I get the idea behind it. Don't get me wrong. I totally get the idea behind it. I'm not just mad because the Sox lost that game and it it was whatever. But um, I I think if you were, if you're, if you're dead set and hell bent on starting a runner on a base, I'd rather you do it on first base. Mm Mm-hmm. That way, if you have a situation where kind of like the, the Sox aren't a good example of this, but last night with the Angels losing to the Dodgers, they didn't get the Dodgers didn't get a hit in the inning, and they scored a run. They didn't even get a base runner. They, they didn't. Yeah, they didn't get a base runner. Yeah. Base runner. Yeah. The 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 minimum requirement for this should be that you're able to get a hit and advance this runner, or at least put the ball in play and force the other team to make an error or something. I think if you were to start the runner at first base rather than second base, I'd have much less issue with it. Just, just from a personal standpoint, because you, you still have to get a hit in order to um, advance the runner. Or, or something, the, the oppo- at the very least, the opponent has to make a mistake. Like, yeah. the, the Angels didn't make a mistake last night and still lost. Mm-hmm. In that sense, yeah, the pitcher got three straight outs and still lost. Right, that's it's got to be crushing. I it's know like, Joe Madden said that uh, I was raised to not speak on things I want to speak. I saw of. that. I, I mean, even something like if it was a pass ball that got the runner to second, and now the exact same thing happened. Well, that's an error that was made on the defense, and now that that put them in that situation. Mm-hmm. I would feel a lot better if the runner was starting on first base rather than second base for scenarios like we saw with the Angels, and then, I don't know, the Sox lost an extra innings. I don't like the extra inning rule. That's how that came Peter up. has an uh, alternate idea for how to Yeah, I'm sure innings. Peter's like, yeah, I'm not too worried about that because the okay. Indians won that game. Rain yeah. delay paid us back there. Yeah. yeah. I was talking that. about his <laughs> suggestion of instead of having a run oh, yes. on second base, Remove a fielder every inning. Well, that was our founder's idea to remove a fielder after every extra inning, I believe. Yeah, Which Jeremy Frank came idea. up with that one. Um, yeah, my idea was instead of banning the shift was to remove a fielder. Interesting. Um, but I do like uh, our founder's idea. I think that would be very entertaining to watch six <laughs> yeah. fielders in the 13th inning or whatever. Become the bench warmers. Yeah. <laughs> now, um, I'm very uh, split on the rule because – Days are four, no, an extra inning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but also, uh, it cost J.C. Wendelk in his uh, inning streak without allowing a run. And also, I have a very soft spot for all relief pitchers in my heart. So, yeah. anything that makes them, that has them be at a disadvantage, I do not like. But it's really hard to find an alternate way to keep games from going into, say, the eight inning, mm-hmm. uh, which cannot happen in a situation like this. Yeah. I mean, imagine if a Cardinals game went to 18 innings. That would be horrible. I mean, and like then, I said, I, I get why this is happening. I, I get the need to try and minimize the amount of games or amount of innings that are played in a game. But at the same time, to do everything right and still lose a game in extra innings – I, I think it's a little tough to swallow. Again, it's not something that happened to the Sox, but it's something that happened to the Angels last night. Uh-huh. I, I think to do everything right and still lose, I think is a frustrating um, scenario. Yeah, I think that this rule should really only be used this year and not in the future. Instead, I think they should just give metal bats to the teams. Oh, yeah. <laughs> let's, let's see what happens with a metal bat game. <laughs> That could be exciting in its own way. Uh, one of my favorite quotes about Mel Bass, Dave Parker was, did, took batting practice with one, said he could hit 600 in a season. The first said, that's a very high average, Mr. Parker. He said, no, home runs. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always wonder what it would look like. I almost wish they did, like, home run derbies or metal like bats. Metal bats but... We don't want to kill the people. Yeah, I was going to say, you'd kill the people in the stands and the poor kids that catch these fly balls out in the outfield that they allow on yeah. the field. But Yeah. 
I tried this uh, transition last week and I'm going to use it again because I liked it and it went over well. Let's close the storybook and turn on the TV and figure out what everyone is watching in baseball this week. <laughs> Kelly uh, laughed. No one else laughed. All right, fine. <laughs> uh, I'm going to check out the Rays Yankees series because, like I said, the Rays haven't really given the Yankees a challenge for their crown yet this season. This could be the series where they do that and, oh, I don't think they can overtake the Orioles, but maybe come closer, get in a more secure playoff spot instead of just hanging in the wild card. I think mm -hmm. that the Rays are also just a really fun team to watch. Yeah, I agree. I think baseball is better if you put in the Rays in the playoffs. You're going to see something different every time. Yeah. Peter, what are you watching this week? Um, well, right after we get done here, I'm going to turn on the ongoing Tigers-Indian game. <laughs> but um, – I've actually missed some late night ba baseball the couple of, the last couple of days, so I'm going to turn on some Oakland A's games. Yeah, because I I would love to watch that team more. I think they're exciting. They've got young pitching, great lineup. Um, also the AL West in general, like even the Mariners are entertaining to watch, even mm -hmm. though they're not good. I'm going to definitely catch some baseball out west. Thatcher, what you watching this week? And I know the White Sox game is on, so I know it's going to be that too. <laughs> yeah. Well, staying out west, uh, I'm going to look at the Rockies Astros game because you got Kyle Freeland going on the mound, who's 2 0 against another 2 0 pitcher for the Astros. I have no idea how to say his last name. So his first name's Brandon. Don't know how to say his last name. Oh, Belak. Bailey. Oh, not Belak. That's how you say yeah. it. Yeah. It's a Notre okay. Dame baseball player right there. Fun story about <laughs> that on a quick aside. Um, I did stats for the, or did Anna Fighting Lakes. Irish for the Fighting Irish back when I was there and he was part of the staff that I was doing the stats yeah. on at the same point. So fun little fact, but I digress. <laughs> Thatcher, back to you. Uh, so see if how Kylan Freeland does against a big lineup that the mm -hmm. Astros have, mm -hmm. even with uh, Brantley and Alvarez, I still got big names in Altuve, Springer, Correa. Yeah. Bregman. Bregman, yeah. Is Gurry allowed? Gurry? Yeah. I don't know. It's, it's I think Gurry Gurry is in. But, I mean, you bring up a good point, Thatcher. Yeah. Freeland had that great 2018 season. Wasn't great mm -hmm. during 2019. You pointed out he's gotten off to a great start in 2020. This is a good test for him. And I, I think mm -hmm. that's absolutely something worth watching. For me – Cubs play the Sox this coming week after uh, their Detroit series, so it's a good way to get my heart rate going and practice yeah. um, my patience on Twitter. But that'll be a fun one for me. It'll be good for the Sox to get yeah. against probably one of the better teams they've played this year outside of the Twins and the Indians um, to get, like, a really good, like, top-quality ball club with some top-quality pitching. Um, see how they respond to it. it. It hasn't been favorable recently. Um, but it's, it's also interesting to watch the Cubs, too, and how they've responded in David Ross's first year. But well, let's wrap like it up with on. some uh, – I'll go ahead, sorry. Hopefully it's like those practice games before the start of the season. Oh, coaches. yeah. Let's hope the Sox play well. I, I, I would agree yeah. with that, absolutely. But let's wrap it up with some Sunday Night Baseball predictions since we record before Sunday Night Baseball. And by the time you're all listening to this, you'll be able to tell us how wrong we were every week. But it was only me who was wrong last week. Everyone else pre predicted the Indians to win. I, of course, <laughs> predicted the White Sox, and we yeah. know how that went. This I week we've got it. Red Sox-Yankees. I'm sure we're going to come to a consensus on this unless someone decides they want to uh, – be someone as the outlier here. The Yankees I, are throwing J. Hap. Oh, you're going to be the outlier. All oh, right. J. Hap. That Yankees makes a are lot throwing J. Hap. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's Chris Mazza for the Red yeah. Sox. Peter, who you got? And what's the final score going to be? Um, I'll go Yankees, but it's going to be high scoring. So I'll go Yankees. You're going to win. We'll go 10-7 final. Thatcher? I'm going with the Red Sox, and I'm having them win six to four. All right, Kelly. Um, I think the Yankees are gonna get revenge for that game in 2018. Uh, 15 to 
six. Fifteen to six. All right. I will. I'm gonna take the Red Sox. I like the lineup. I like the lineup against the left-hander. I'm gonna go high scoring as well. I'm gonna go nine, seven, Red Sox. I'm threatening to go zero for two on this uh, <laughs> Sunday night baseball predictions thing, but I'm gonna do it anyway. But You're again, feel man. free to tell us how wrong. Yeah, uh, I'm brave, crazy, whatever you want to call me. I'll take anything there in between. <laughs> But that's going to do it for us this week. Uh, thanks for listening and tuning in as always. We are happy to bring you what is now the third episode of This Week in Baseball. And we will be back for plenty more conversations throughout the weeks. Uh, make sure to find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. As I've said before, Twitter is our main outlet at diamond underscore digest. Also look at diamonddigest.com uh, where all of our fabulous writers are turning in great pieces every week. and. I know Callie is one who's constantly on top of their game and Thatcher and Peter always have great analysis to provide as well as all of our other writers. Um, but that's going to do it for us this week. So for Thatcher Zalewski, Callie Sai, and Peter Kayat, this is Jordan Lazowski signing off. Take care, everyone. Enjoy your week. Yep. And we'll talk to you next week. Have a good one.